Hello, and welcome to DU's 20th Annual Diversity Summit. We are glad you could join us for this session. In the spirit of healing and peace, we acknowledge and honor the indigenous peoples of the land upon which the University of Denver stands, the Arapaho, Cheyenne, and Ute tribes. A few reminders before we get started. This year, we as a DU community will be exploring the interplay and intersections of the impact of 2020 through a lens of anti-racism and anti-discrimination. Together, we will examine the many ways in which our collective past informs our shared diversity, equity, and inclusion work for the future. For some, the topics covered may include triggering or emotionally challenging topics. Please feel free to exit the event and return later as necessary. We will be closely monitoring our time together and do not condone threatening or violent language. Rather, this space is meant to provide us opportunities to learn, question, and grow. We hope you will join us on this journey. Please note your camera is off and your microphone is muted. The Q&A feature is at the bottom of your screen for you to ask questions of the panelists. We will attempt to answer as many questions as possible. The conversation is being recorded and will be made available on Canvas within a week of this event. Here's a quick reminder of the Zoom controls. Take a moment to locate the chat, Q&A feature, closed caption, and leave button at the bottom of your screen. Lastly, we ask that you share your experience via social media. We will be using the hashtag DU Diversity Summit throughout these seven weeks. Now, I would like to introduce um, our three panelists and moderator for the day. Um, the first being Joey Ha. Um, she has been an activist and organizer for the Asian Pacific Islander American community in Colorado for over 10 years, with focuses on anti-racist work, civic engagement, and the intersection of art and activism. She has a BA in anthropology and a master's in development practice with a focus on holistic methods of treating mental health for the Vietnamese refugee community in Denver. She currently works as a partnership specialist for the U.S. Census Bureau, specializing in outreach for undercounted populations and serves as vice chair for the Denver Asian American Pacific Islander Commission. Next, we have Lisa Calderon um, as chief of staff serving Council District 9, which has the highest concentration of both wealth and poverty in the city. Dr. Calderon works to advance policy priorities for the, resolving the affordable housing crisis, stemming the tide of gentrification and displacement through a civil rights framework, and reducing the mass of incarceration and increasing gender equality. Next is Sol Watson, um, who is the founder and chief visionary officer for Righteous Rage Institute for Healing and Social Justice. Born and raised in Northeast Denver, Colorado, an East Angel High School graduate, attended Howard University, the Mecca, and later traveled the world, spending a decade living in Africa, raising his family in Ghana. Sol is a prolific writer, speaker, facilitator, communications professional who has been using his talents, experience, and skills to create and support stimulating, engaging, and innovative community initiatives that usher in social change. And finally, we have our moderator, Dr. Tom Romero, who is the interim vice chancellor, um, an associate professor at law, and an affiliate faculty for the Department of History. And without further ado, I'll let you take it away, Tom. Well, good afternoon, everybody. Um, it is really my honor to be um, having a, uh, what I'm really excited about, a really engaging and I think impactful conversation with Joey, Sol, and, and Lisa. Um, as, as you just heard from their bios, three real massive change agents uh, for our uh, my racially minoritized communities here in, in Denver and, and Colorado and, and the larger Rocky Mountain West. Um, our panel today is going to do um, work a little differently than some of our previous panels. What, what we're going to actually do is I'm going to give a bit of a um, 20 to 25 minute presentation, really sort of examining and looking at the history of 
race and race relations in Denver and Colorado. And so once we have that sort of have that grounding, I then want to engage in a conversation about um, with with Joey and Sol and Lisa about what is what's missing from this history, and, and most importantly, how does this history inform their work uh, in, in the spaces that, that they're in, and why this history is important for just our larger work of, of racial justice moving forward. So um, that will be how we're going to proceed today, and I am going to start sharing my screen right now and then let's let's launch into the presentation so how i want to frame this uh, for all of us that are here today is really to situate situate us in the space of colorado and many of you are familiar right with this sign welcome to colorful colorado and as you, as many of you are familiar with the sign, when you drive in from I-70 or maybe I-25 into the state, this sign, of course, evokes, I think, certain image, images, right? The, the Purple Mountains majesty, the, the yellow golden plains, right? The snow-capped peaks, the white snow-capped peaks. So there are all these images of Colorado that are rooted in nature. What I wanna do and I wanna do for us today is really sort of begin to, to challenge that conception of what colorful Colorado means. And what I want, want to do is for us to think about what the color line actually means. What, when we're talking about colorful Colorado, we're not just talking about natural space, we're talking about human space. And so my presentation is gonna go in, in a couple of parts today. One is to really sort of talk about this tension between Colorado as being a space of very deep and immense color lines uh, dividing people, but also this, at least mythology and this trope that we are a colorblind space. And so that, that's the, the first place that I want to um, talk about. The second is I really want to talk about the ways that the color line and the history of, of Denver in particular has been constructed, uh, largely through law, but of course enforced by, by social uh, values, by uh, politics. I then want to uh, bring us a bit into the present day. Why is this history important? What is, how does this history inform our, our current struggles? And finally, I, I wanna suggest one tool that I think that uh, many of us that are engaged in, in, in the field of, of racial justice might use in order to, to raise this, this history um, moving forward. So let me jump in here uh, a bit. First, I wanna talk a little bit about the terminology. And so many of us are familiar with the term race, right? Um, we know it's a so social construct. We know it's contextual. What I want to introduce, and I really want us to think about, is the way that these racial ideas are reinforced by, by the law, right? And it's really the law that gives race meaning. And particularly in the United States, and specifically here in Colorado and, and in Denver, right? The, the color line has been defined be between who is, is white and who is non-white, right? So what does the law do? It extends rewards and benefits and or it punishes, right? So I, I really want us to think about the color line um, as informing race in, in those sorts of ways. And this has a particular resonance in, in Colorado um, that I think is also something that we've been thinking about as a nation for, for certainly the last um, decade or, or 12 years since you know, President Obama was elected and we sort of talked about this post-racial society. That this is something that certainly Colorado has been dealing with. And I want to I want to sort of think about this tension between what it means to be color consciousness in our work and what it means to be colorblind. And what we're, I think we're moving to, and I think what this history that I'm going to share with you in our conversation today is really going to be about, is the ways that we can be color conscious, uh, particularly as a tool of, of racial justice work. All right. So let me get into this first part here. Uh, Colorado and Denver as incomparable color and colorblind space. So Colorado has long had this, this narrative about it being a colorblind space. In fact, it was a place where if you were a person of color in this country, you could come uh, free from the shackles of slavery, from Jim Crow, um, fr from any sort of racial ideology and sort of begin anew, right? And one of the prime examples that people point to is uh, the town of Deer, Deerfield, uh, which was uh, touted as an African-American utopia in the late 19th and early 20th century. 
Uh, it was designed as a place for African Americans who were, were leaving the South, particularly the, the Jim Crow South post reconstruction, as a place to find freedom, to, to find opportunity, um, and, and certainly a, a, as a place to, to really live the American dream, right? So Colorado became an epicenter of at least of, of these ideas. But of course, we know as well, Colorado was deeply steeped in, in a, a racial and a racist history. During the 1920s, the same time that Deerfield was trying to be established, uh, the Ku Klux Klan, uh, Colorado became the center, uh, the epicenter of Ku Klux Klan power. The governor of Colorado was a Klansman. One of its US senators was a Klansman. The majority of state legislators were, were Klansmen. The mayor of Denver was, was a Klansman. The, uh, the chief of police, uh, the, the, the head of the sheriff's department was a Klansman, right? So the Klan really rose to prominence here in, in, in Colorado. And so we have this tension. Fast forward into the 1980s. And um, when Federico Pena was, was elected mayor, he did so based upon a broad-based multiracial coalition, right? And so uh, prognosticators pointed to, to Denver as this city, right, that was very progressive, very forward-looking when it, it came to race relations, right? But of course, we know that that's in, in much of the same ways that did not evoke a sort of post-racial era, right? But co continued racism, continued racist ideologies continued to be embedded within the landscape and within the segregated neighborhoods of, of Denver, Colorado. Now, of course, there's a longer history of this. Uh, Colorado, uh, Denver, which it sits, was a state that was forged out of what many historians and scholar, scholars have called the, the racialized, uh, racialized wars of the 19th century. We can certainly think about um, Native American and indigenous removal that happened. Certainly uh, talk a little bit about the use connection to that. The Mexican-American War, the Civil War, right? If you look here and if you look at this map, right, what became Colorado Territory was at the center of the, the larger question about how slavery would exist in, ex, in expanding the United States. So Colorado, its, it's literal boundaries were formed out of all of these racialized wars. No surprise, this became embedded within the color line, within the laws of the state, right? Uh, very early on in Colorado's history, its territorial history, uh, it banned marriages, Colorado banned marriages between blacks and whites. Now, interestingly enough, it created this exception between those who lived um, in what was at one time Mexico, right? Uh, we had um, racially segregated schools very early in our history, right? Pre-statehood. We, of course, had the Sand Creek Massacre and, of course, the use connection from John Evans and John Livingston to, um, to the, the killing of Arapaho and Cheyenne elders, women and children, right, on the banks of the Sand Creek. In, in 1864. But of course you have this tension, right? Colorado, it, it, Colorado's promise. Um, Colorado, um, when it became a state, was the only constitution that, that provided for uh, multilingualism as part of its public acts, right? So its public acts, its constitution needed to be printed in both German and Spanish. And that was true until 1899. We had anti-slavery pro prohibitions in our state constitution. We provided for the property rights of immigrants, for migrants to the states, right? For, so for non-Americans. And so this tension is really at the heart of what, when you start thinking about Colorado that, that we are dealing with and what we're dealing with today. So what does this look like here in, in Denver, um, where the University of Denver sits and where my, my esteemed colleagues and panelists today make their practice? Well, we had um, the color lines that were reinforced through, through property law. So many of you may have heard of these things called racial restrictive covenants, right? So these are, uh, co these are covenants that exist in uh, deeds and title to real property that prevent people from, from a certain race, particularly non-whites from living in particular neighborhoods. Well, Denver had these all over the place, right? Um, they were in uh, many neighborhoods in, in the Denver area. They were in the suburbs, in particular in Jefferson County. And of course, this was reinforced through the practices of the real estate industry that 
created these red line red, redlining maps, right? To basically keep neighborhoods segregated. And so you, as you look here, and I'll sort of point out with the pointer here, a lot of the racial restrictive covenants that we see in, in Denver in particular, they're right in the edges of um, these, these yellow lines here. And the whole idea behind them was to keep these neighborhoods segregated, right? Uh, to keep the concentration of largely um, African-American, Latinx, uh, but also indigenous and, and Asian Pacific Americans uh, within these red areas. And in fact, if you look at the, the, the history of settlement, this is where you see the historic patterns of settlement and, and you see the real color line happening in, in Denver. We also know the color line was enforced through criminal law, um, highlighted the anti-miscegenation statute, which stayed on the books, um, most importantly, into the 1950s. And so we see the enforcement of this statute against uh, the Chinese during the 1880s. Uh, there was a, a sizable uh, Chinese and, and what became a Chinese American president, presence in Denver, certainly enforced against um, uh, black and white relationships. And in, as late as 1942, the Colorado Supreme Court during, the, during World War II, so this is when we were fighting racism, we're fighting fascism as a country, the United States Supreme Court actually upholds uh, this anti-miscegenation statute. And in, in the 1950s, the Colorado State Legislature finally um, eliminates this as a matter of law. We, know, we see it in policing, right? So in the police manuals of uh, the Denver Police Department, they're very conscious about uh, the, the, where the race line, where the color line exists. Immigration law. Um, in the 1930s, the governor of Colorado declared martial law for only the second time in the history of Colorado. He deployed the National Guard to the, the border between Colorado and New Mexico. Now, I don't know how many of you have thought of Colorado as an international border, but apparently we were. And the whole purpose of declaring martial law was to keep Mexi Mexicans, right, and, and militarizing the border was to keep Mexicans out of the state of Colorado. And the reality of, of it was, was this. Um, most of the people that were coming in, into Colorado uh, who were of Mexican descent, they were actually American citizens, right? But nonetheless, in 1935 and again in 1936, when martial law was declared, you had a whole militarization of, of Colorado's border. Um, and, uh, and you also had vigilante groups that were spre spreading fear and violence all throughout the state as they themselves were, were taking up, right, the cause of, of anti-Mexican prejudice uh, that was happening in the, in the 1930s. During World War II, this continued. Uh, in Colorado, we had, um, we had one of the relocation internment camps of Japanese Americans who were removed from the West Coast of California uh, to the largely Intermountain West. One of those places existed here in Colorado, otherwise known as um, Granada or the, the Amachi uh, Center uh, in southeastern Colorado. Um, an interesting thing actually happened as a result of, of um, this detention uh, that, that, that was occurring in southeastern Colorado. Not far from the Japanese American internment camp was also an Italian and German prisoner of war camp. And what had happened uh, during World War II as a result of labor shortages is that Japanese Americans, as well as German and Italian prisoners of war were contracted out to work in Colorado's agricultural fields, to plant the crop, uh, to, to pick the crop, right? And what ended up happening uh, was a, um, uh, a Japanese American woman actually fell in love with, with a German prisoner of war and ultimately helped him escape. Uh, there were three sisters, all American-born uh, Japanese Americans, uh, who who were uh, interned in this camp. Uh, they were ultimately uh, brought to uh, trial uh, in, in in Denver, in the federal district court. This is the first and only treason trial to involve Japanese Americans during World War II, and during the course of the trial, um, a lot of sort of real interesting conversations happened about these women and their Americanness. Uh, these women and their gender. And ultimately what ended up happening is that the court, um, the, the jury found them not guilty of treason, but conspiracy to com commit treason, which was a much smaller offense. And largely it was, it was based on the fact that these German prisoners of war, uh, 
they were actually, they claimed to be anti-Nazis. In fact, they were part of the resistance. They were trying to escape to go, to go fight, um, to go fight um, back in, in, in Europe against, against the Nazis and, and the German Nazis. So real interesting, you know, sort of tension and parallel that, that's happening um, within that trial. Another place that the color line uh, is, was reinforced was, was through education law. Um, Denver, the Denver Public Schools in particular, um, had really maintained a practice of segregation that really began to become very noticeable beginning in the 1950s and really kind of explodes into, into the 1960s. And what ends up happening as a result of what became a, a, a Supreme Court case, the first non-Southern Supreme Court case to make it uh, to the United States Supreme Court was that we found out, and there was actually University of Denver professor, University of Denver students that were working with the legal team, that if you looked at the attendance boundaries uh, that the Denver Public School District was drawing every year, what they were doing beginning in the 50s and extending into the 60s um, and even in the 70s was they were manipulating the attendance boundaries to maximize segregation in the schools. So if you think back to where people lived as a result of redlining, as a result of racial restrictive covenants, as a result of the enforcement of criminal law, just sort of imagine, um, I don't have the, the best GPS software, right? But this is what they were doing. They were overlaying these maps, right? Um, over one another, right? Where, where, where the concentration of poverty was, where the concentration of people of color were, where the school attendance boundaries were. And they match perfectly, right, to maximize segregation in, in the city. So this really sort of highlighted, you know, the idea and the importance of Denver was no different, right? Denver was no different than any of these other cities and any of these other places, right, that had been racked by a history of segregation and racism uh, as part of its history. And of course, uh, the response to this, um, which, which the response was ultimately a Supreme Court case in which the Supreme Court found that Denver schools were segregated was that Denver then needed to desegregate. And the response in, in many cases was violence, right? Um, it was protests and violence. School bombs were bus, um, um, school buses were bombed, right? Uh, lawyers were threatened. The judge presiding on the case had his family threatened, had bombs put outside of um, uh, his residence. Of course, the plaintiffs, right? A, a multiracial coalition of black uh, Latinx and, and white students, right, were, were threatened and mocked as, as they went to school. So this really sort of defined, right, the way that um, segregation also continued to be, be enforced even after a court order um, was, was um, put into place. So that's a, uh, a brief kind of overview. Um, what I want to do now in, in these last two parts then is really kind of bring this story up to, to the present day. So if we think of, um, of, of, the, of kind of the current moment. And th this map here is a bit outdated since we've had uh, a mayor, mayoral election that, that has since taken place since this, uh, including um, as a candidate in that, um, our own Lisa Calderon. Um, but this map for me really highlights the persistence of the segregation that, that exists in Denver. So this map is a reflection of what would be three different color lines, right, in, in Colorado. A Michael Hancock, um, African American, um, may, becomes mayor. James Mejia, a Latinx um, uh, candidate for mayor, and Christopher Romer, uh, a white candidate for mayor. And if you look at their levels of support, they really tracked, at least in 2011, you know, really kind of the the history and the legacy of racial segregation in in, in our city. Of course, the, the, the consequence, the meaning of this uh, is, is certainly impacted by demographics, right? So we know that Denver in particular is becoming a quote unquote majority minority city, right? In which people of color, um, uh, you know, will represent the largest group in the city. Uh, and that's certainly true um, in, in the Denver public schools. Um, it's certainly multiracial, right? So the color line uh, cuts across a couple different ways. Um, um, on multiple ways, if, if you look at it. Um, and of course, it, it has Im implications for where people live, right? And so if you're looking at, at the, the city and county of Denver here, um, this is one example of some of the, the changing demographics and changing reordering of, of the racial line in the city. 
uh, that of course is, and this isn't the best map, but I think it sort of highlights this larger question of gentrification, right? As we have historic neighborhoods that have been segregated, that themselves now are being gentrified and communities of color being pushed out, um, you know, oftentimes brazenly and, and at a rapid uh, pace, it has huge implications for our community. And so there, there's a couple of different ways, I think, in which this happens. Um, one that happened fairly recently um, in uh, the Five Points neighborhood and involving a, um, a gentrifier, right? An ink coffee, uh, this ink coffee who, who came into the neighborhood um, and sort of, sort of didn't understand the history of what had been the epicenter of uh, certainly black culture and life in the Intermountain West, uh, the center of black culture and life between Kansas City, Missouri and Los Angeles, California for, for decades. And really sort of thinking about what the implications it did of sort of saying, you know, they were happily gentrifying their neighborhood, which meant pushing out the people and the history that were, were part of this neighborhood. So we, we have that legacy and it's really sort of in some ways going back to the, the racialized wars, right? It's a legacy of conquest. It's certainly part of the history of, um, of Colorado. Much more recently and certainly much to the present day, we can certainly think of um, the movement and uh, sort of the, the, the movement and the pandemic of racial violence, particularly police violence, right? Against uh, people of color. Uh, Justice for Elijah Mc McCain, I sort of highlight this because one of the things that we know that has happened in the Denver area and the Denver metropolitan area in the last 20 years is that some of our greatest amounts of diversity are actually not in the city and county of Denver itself, but actually in its suburbs, places like Aurora, for instance, right? And of course, um, the violence against Elijah, Elijah McCain took, McLean took place there in, in Aurora. So we certainly be thinking you know, much larger in terms of our, our ge geography um, about this. All right, finally, then I, I wanna leave us and, and start turning our conversation to this. Um, I started out my presentation thinking about this tension between color blindness and color consciousness and, ha and hoping that we can reimagine what it means to, to live in colorful Colorado. And so I wanna encourage all of us and certainly encourage our panelists today to, to think about this is what happens if we start thinking about our policies and our practices and our work in very color conscious terms, right? Um, and, I, and, I, and I bring up the idea of racial impact statements, something that we know in the criminal justice world has been uh, taking, um, gaining much strength in the last five years in terms of looking at, at what would be the impact of uh, the, the racial impact or the societal impact uh, on criminal justice reform. And we've seen places like Minnesota and Iowa, um, Iowa in particular, right? A uh, past legislation asking for racial impact statements in, in at least in the criminal justice realm. But you know, what does this mean if we start becoming color conscious? Um, PolicyLink and, and others have looked at this. And here, here's if we sort of look at it in terms of e economic terms, right? If we started becoming color conscious in our policy and our practice, it would result in a net, uh, uh, $40 million gain uh, for us here as a, as, a mount, as, as a matter of our GDP here in Colorado, right? It would mean we would be creating equity. We would be responding to these institutional and systemic barriers. So I leave us with this final um, sort of uh, this mural. And I really, this, this mural for me really encapsulates the way that I wanted to reimagine what colorful Colorado means. This is, to me, is really the entree point to understanding our state, right? It's this landscape of color, uh, but the color is the people, right? And it's a color that has been defined by a color line between white and non-white. But of course that who is non-white also not just, we're not talking about the black and white color line, we're talking about Latinx, Asian Pacific American and Islanders, um, indigenous peoples, right? And so this is part of our history and this is part of our story. And um, I hope that gives us enough to, to really start jumping and, and launching in, into the conversation. I'm trying to stop sharing my screen. There we go. So, Sol, Lisa, Joey, I don't know uh, if you have some, some thoughts on this. You know, I guess my first question for, for all of you is, what's missing? 
you know what this was a very quick history that that I, that I had to, to go through um, from each of your vantage points what what should we dig a little bit more into oh go ahead Joey oh Thank you, Lisa. Um, I just wanted to um, thank you, Tom, for sharing all this amazing information with us. I also learned some new things as well. Uh, something that really stuck out to me is how you said in various points in uh, Denver and Colorado history, we have definitely um, advertised ourselves as being relatively progressive. And um, <clears throat> Back when uh, we were interning Japanese Americans and forcibly removing them from their homes, um, Governor Ralph Carr was actually um, said to be very progressive. He was one of the only politicians that had dissented um, against the internment of American nationals. However, at the end of the day, he still um, had Camp Amachi made here in Colorado. Um, and although the amenities were uh, different and um, considerably better than other um, internment camps, at the end of the day, a prison is still a prison. The guns are still pointing inside. Um, and so that really resonated with me. So I wanna um, thank you for um, that particular um, point. Something that um, is missing, I think, and something that the Asian American Pacific Islander Commission is working on um, is the actual, the first race riot in Denver was actually anti-Chinese race riot. And that was back in October 31st, 1880. And um, it ended with all of the businesses within a Chinatown were destroyed. And then they had lynched a Chinese man. Um, and actually this Chinatown existed on um, Wazi from 14th to 17th. So it's in the middle of downtown Denver. Um, but nowadays, if you go into that area, there is no evidence that it ever existed. Um, the riot itself was um, used as an example for further discrimination, um, stopping um, Chinese immigrants from arriving. And because of all the different laws, the Chinatown in that area slowly dwindled down. And um, again, it was no longer existed. We do have um, Chinese uh, communities here, but mostly along Federal Boulevard. Um, but in downtown Denver, um, there really is no evidence that there was ever a Chinatown there. So something that we're trying to do is to bring awareness to it, to let folks know that um, we have existed here for quite a while um, and that there were definitely um, times where um, the public was not happy that we were here. Thank you, thank you, Joey. Lisa, I think you were gonna jump in too. Yeah, yeah, first I wanna just thank you all for having me here because this is like food for my soul. Um, working in uh, Councilwoman Santa Baca's uh, District 9 office uh, where I, where I um, also live in the district. Um, you know, it's hard um, when we get, you know, people constantly contacting our office to get rid of unhoused people, um, to critique why are we talking about, you know, um, gentrification and displacement, um, you know, and, and predominantly it's, it's, you know, white wealthy folks or privileged folks who don't get this history. And so I'm glad that we are having this conversation. Um, so I'm not sure so much as what's missing, but also what to punctuate. Um, so with the Klan legacy, I think it's important to remember that, um, particularly since it took um, the murder of George, George Floyd for the people in Stapleton uh, to finally vote to change that name um, after years and years. In fact, I remember, you know, I'm a Denver native and I remember um, emailing then Councilman Hancock and saying, Stapleton then was in his district and, and asking, why are you not supporting this change from the name of a Klansman and never got a response. Um, I think it's important to remember that um, even though the Klan um, were in power, as you indicated, um, in the 19, early 1920s, um, we're still dealing with that legacy of consolidated power from the time of the Klan. And so the fact that we have a very concentrated um, mayoral system of government where the mayor has, you know, basically appoints all of the boards and commissions, that was intentional. And so it doesn't really matter the fact that if we have a person of color in there or not, if the policies that are perpetuated are building on this precedent, this legacy of Klan consolidated power. 
So that's problematic. Um, I think part of the, the redlining legacy also takes us to issues of, you know, as you pointed out in the map, um, you know, it wasn't just where you could live, it was like identified as hazardous areas, meaning you have a green light to put um, polluting industries here um, and to not invest <clears throat> in infrastructure to uh, relegate us to food deserts and all of that, you know, that redlining history has an impact on our health as well. And so, you know, the fact that we have to, um, you know, still, you know, one of our, um, the most polluted zip code in America, um, in terms of where the GES uh, Global Illyria Swansea neighborhoods are, um, because they sit on two super fun sites with a uh, massive highway that is only getting bigger um, and that has displaced folks, but they're constantly exposed to uh, uh, pollution and chronic illnesses that go back generations. Um, so redlining is also a legacy of health inequity and neglect in that way. We have to look at the um, that redlining part of that legacy that brings us up to today is also that for a lot of um, middle-class families and certainly for people of color, a lot of our wealth was in our homes. And so by the time the recession, the, the recession of 2007 to 2009, we're not even talking about the COVID recession, 63% um, or so of our wealth as, as folks of color were devastated, were, were knocked out. And so we are seeing this resurgence of redlining, this new form of redlining now post that recession. Well, first part of that was predatory lending. Um, so the, the newer kind of redlining. Uh, and then we have the gentrification and, uh, and you know, things like a group living ordinance uh, where we're trying to address and rectify some of those legacies of redlining, but still hear very dog whistle type of opposition that were used to also redline people out of our neighborhoods. Like, you know, you're gonna open it up to crime and criminals, you're gonna be living next door. And I always assume I'm living next door to someone who could be that way anyway. This is a neighborhood I grew up with, I grew up in, right? And just because you are a, a white um, middle-class or wealthy gentrifier doesn't mean that you don't have problems in your own home too. Um, so when we look at these dog whistle tactics, uh, including um, not only criminals, but also property values will fall if you allow you know, le lessening of restrictions on, on our group living code, that really is hearkening back to this history of who should, you know, who should stay out of our neighborhood. So, you know, I think that there's a whole lot there. I'll come back to the ink coffee controversy in a minute, but those are just some of my uh, opening thoughts. Thank you, Lisa. So. Yes, you know, Going behind both Joey and Lisa, there's really not much else left to be said, fortunately. Um, first of all, I want to thank you, Tom, for inviting me on here. It's, it's great to meet Joey. Of course, Lisa and I go, as they say uh, in the neighborhood, we go back like reclining chairs. So long, long time ago, I'm not telling my age, and I don't think we'll, we'll go there. But it's great to be on the panel. It's great to see you, Lisa and Joey. Um, again, there's... Um, there's not much left to be said. I, you know, what, what I thought was really fascinating in the presentation and that I, I would hope for that we would take a deeper dive in is the violence that was taking place, um, specifically around education, right, which tends to be my wheelhouse. And to uh, see, you know, what, what's, what was, uh, what's a deeper dive around um, the education piece is exactly um, all the machinations that uh, the, the white power structure went through then and are still engaged in all, all the way up until today, as even speaking right now. Um, and in and, and a place like, and I also cringe also when I hear Denver being a progressive place. Like that's, that, that's you know, and when I hear things like colorful Colorado, like whoever coined that was, they were talking about nature. They were not talking about the people, right? And let's just be very honest about that. They were talking about the Aspens and the beautiful skies. They were not talking about the beautiful black people and the beautiful brown people and the beautiful indigenous people. So I love what you're doing, Tom, as far as turning that uh, uh, term on its head 
in order for it to incorporate the actual people um, that were here and, and that here and that have been been here. And so um, it, it, again, in that vein, I'm a graduate of East High School and uh, going back into, into the conversation around education and taking a deeper dive. And <clears throat> I didn't understand, it, 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 unless you go to East High School, and for those of you who are, who are, who are listening, who, are, who are, are familiar with Denver, familiar with East High School, East High School is the school that our current mayor drove his child past Bello High School in order to get to, right? So he passed my Bello High School, which was a hot mess, uh, to take his child into East High School, which was out of his district. And I graduated from that high school, and there's a reason why. Um, and I actually live in the district. I'm, I'm, I'm in the house and in the neighborhood that I grew up in, like Lisa. My grandmother grew up on 25th and Vine. I grew up on 29th and Vine. Right now, I'm on 22nd and York. So I my whole life has been encompassed in about these seven blocks, right? East High School is right down the street. And so I say that to say that when I was at East High School, I thought that I went to an all black school or at least a predominantly black school. And that's because I didn't realize that there were different track, that the segregation that was inside of East High School actually took, side, it took place inside the building. Meaning that there were pockets and places inside of that school that black students never saw because they weren't in the advanced classes. They weren't in the, you know, uh, the, the, the college prep classes. We weren't in those classes. Um, and so on the outside, it gives the allure once lunchtime hits or the school is over and you see all these black and brown and white faces coming out together, what's taking place inside the school is quite different. And GW is another one of those schools. TJ is another one of those schools that you would never know that. And to me, that's violence. Right, that, that, that's a form of violence that we have to really get into as far as segregation as the education that these children are receiving or not inside of these schools. So I love the, the, the contextualization, right? So East High School would have, it, it very well could have been called colorful East High School, right? And everything is great color, you know, all the rainbow is here. But once you go inside of that school, just like once you go inside of Denver, as Lisa has alluded to and as Joy alluded to, there's a much different story to tell about Denver and about Colorado overall. So I, I wanna pick up a bit on that idea of violence, because I think in, in, in the history, um, maybe I'll, I'll turn it back a little bit. And so maybe Lisa, if you, and then I'll turn to Joy. Um, and, and Joy, since, since, since Solsor took us down that path, um, what, what what do you what's your sense? Why has there been such a resistance to understanding not just the race the, the history, some of the history that I talked about, something that all of you talk about, but really that that to, to, to ex ex excavate and sort of lift up the way that violence has played such such a critical role in in how we talk about ourselves, either as Denverites, either as Coloradoans, uh, either you know we've heard the tropes of, of Westerners too, right? And of course. You know, if you're indigenous, there's no West. This is the center, right? And and so, I'm curious, um, all of your thoughts on on what that means. You know, our our, our failure to to talk about that. Well, there's um, that overt violence that um, you know whether we're talking about policing, which goes hand in hand with gentrification. Um, you know, I grew up in Northwest Denver, but my family has also been on the east side, as we still call it, and grew up here as well. Um, but what we notice is that with every neighborhood that gentrifies, the policing presence increased. Um, and so there was a, the physical violence of, for example, you know, um, years ago, having my son walking home from East High School, being assaulted by the police um, and, and, then, and mocked. Um, so we have that physical violence that happens, um, but we also have that psychological violence that happens when you are perpetually viewed as a suspect, even in your own neighborhood. And that is a particular form of violence because that impacts our children and how they look at themselves and how they look at our futures and our young people um, and not feeling like this is a safe place to be and not seeing themselves in our future. I had a conversation the other day with a kind of the national coordinator with next door. And I, you know, just said honestly to him, like next door is not a safe place for people of color. When you go on those sites, 
and you see suspicious person, black person, or they do everything to, but say black, but everything else they signal as a, as a black or brown person in the neighborhood who, do, who doesn't belong, and yet they just moved into our community, whether it be a month ago or five years ago, um, there, that's also violence. That's saying that it's an erasure of who we are, um, our histories, um, and I appreciate the, the question in the chat from the white uh, male who says, I, I recently moved here and don't want to contribute to gentrification displacement. What do I need to know? I think that's one of the things to know is that just by virtue of erasing us from our communities, by virtue of bringing in more police presence, that is doing violence to us. Um, and so, I, you know, I, I, I want us to think broadly in terms of what is covert and what is overt violence. Uh, Tom, you showed the spray painted house with the N word on there. That was in our district. Um, and so that is, um, and there was a big community response and brother Jeff organized folks around, you know, we were outraged around it and trying to get the police to recognize that as a bias motivated crime. Um, but we recognize those signals as the overt, but less recognition of those covert kind of signals about you don't belong here. And whether it is yet another coffee shop on the block, uh, a brewery, or, you know, in place of, you know, where we used to get our cultural foods or our cultural gatherings, or we just are not welcome there, to think about all of those aspects as, um, as a modern form of colonialism, and, and that is violence. Thank you, Lisa. And, and Joey, I'm curious your thoughts. And in particular, you, you start off talking us about the first race riot, right, in, in, in Colorado, right, was, uh, and in Denver uh, involved the Chinese, in, involved attacks against the Chinese, right? And certainly, um, if we think about Colorado history, you know, there's, there's the moments of the Sand Creek Massacre, right? So the genocide of, of indigenous peoples, the displacement of, of Mexican people. So it, it really speaks to, a, um, you know, a sort of a history of violence too, that's sort of beyond the black, white color line, right? And, and so I'm curious, you know, where you started and kind of continuing the, the, the question, right? why, why, is this, why is that history particularly against uh, the Chinese been, been erased? Absolutely, I think, um... I think we're fearful to talk about these things. About, about these things, we're fearful to acknowledge the fact that um, our state hasn't always been um, this colorful Colorado, as they say it. Um, and when faced with this type of criticism, um, folks in power generally don't like to acknowledge it. They don't like to um, say that they were wrong. They would much rather just move on. Um, and that's the sort of um, feedback uh, oftentimes I think activists in my community get as well is like, why don't you move on? And I, I think this is something that a lot of activists in different um, communities of color hear is, why don't you move on? This was so long ago. Why don't you move on? Um, it's over. Um, however, the fact of the matter is the rippling impacts of these actions are not over. They have continued to exist in different forms, like what Lisa was talking about um, in terms of people feeling unsafe walking um, down their neighborhoods. Um, and similarly, uh, with the uh, coronavirus, we, there are several um, Asian seniors downtown. And at the peak of it, uh, it was uh, heartbreaking because a lot of these seniors were afraid to um, leave their apartments because one, they were old, uh, potentially immunocompromised. They didn't wanna be um, exposed to the virus. And also two, with all the rhetoric in regards to the China virus, the Kung flu, um, there was a rise in anti-Asian hate crimes across the entire country. And because of this, they were afraid that they would be attacked. Um, and there was a case specifically in Texas recently where a father and two of his young children were stabbed at a Sam's Club because um, the perpetrator um, was uh, assuming that they were Chinese, but how, they weren't even Chinese. Um, and I think, uh, so the perpetrator himself was um, Latinx and I actually, if it's okay, would like to address a question that Regina had um, posed. Um, and start talking about um, the tensions between the Black and um, Asian community, um, which is uh, incredibly true. There is anti-Blackness within the Asian community and within the Black community itself, there is a lot of Sinophobia and um, anti-Asian sentiment. 
And um, I really want to acknowledge that one, this exists, and two, talk about um, the cause of this. And this really goes back um, much further than just now, and it goes into the model minority myth. The model minority myth basically was a term created by the powers that be that said Asians are doing well, they're adjusting, um, they are good at math, um, they're docile, they're well behaved. These are good people of color. Why can't everyone else be like this? And a lot of people bought into it. Um, a lot of Asians bought into it, despite the fact that um, when the powers that be are telling you that you're good, you're still in your white adjacent, you're still not white at the end of the day. Um, you're still not white. You will never have the same privileges, the powers afforded to um, the white supremacist uh, hegemony. Um, and then also this uh, created tensions with our community that still exists today. Um, however, I know there's a lot of work being done in um, all of these communities to address these issues. And it's important for us to remember that we truly are stronger together. Um, divide and conquer is one of the oldest games in the book. Um, and we need to be able to make sure that we stand together in order to address true um, systemic inequalities in our um, world. Joey, th thank you for that. And, and um, makes me think, I, I gave the um, example of when the governor declared martial law, right? Um, and of course, to keep Mexicans out. Well, just 10 years earlier, right, um, uh, Colorado and the United States couldn't have enough Mexicans in the state, right? And, and for some of the same reasons, right? Mexicans were well suited to stoop labor, they were docile, they had this manana siesta culture, right? But they were perfectly well suited in particular for sugar beets, right? And so, and you see how that flipped on a dime, right? Um, as a result of, of an economic crisis. So. So thank you for 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 pointing out that piece, and I and and I also I think this is a great pivot here too. And um, so I'll ask you, and and um, and then Joey or Lisa, if you have thoughts about it. But I think as a part of this history, and and one of the reasons I, I invited you all here is that we also in, in this state have a, a history of of multiracial organizing against colonialism, against white supremacy, uh, certainly against discrimination. Um, I know Soul's father was was in some of the front lines of that. Uh, Lisa, you and I have been in, in some of that way, way back early in, in the day. And so um, th there's, there's a, a real sort of important part of that history about organizing you know, across different communities. Um, curious, you, all of your thoughts on, on that, what that history looks like and, and what are its implications are for now as well. So Sol, I'll start with you. Yeah, that's a great question. <clears throat> um, so, so for me, and, and you know, uh, as the Chief Visionary Officer for the Righteous Rage Institute, I when we talk about organizing across um, race and class, right, it's, it's absolutely essential. But again, for Black people in the United States, this is not anything new, right? Like, if you if you harken back even to the Underground Railroad, the Underground Railroad was a multiracial, multi-generational uh, endeavor, right? You had black people, you had brown people, uh, indigenous people who knew the land, you had black people who were, who were working the, the pipeline system, and you had white people who were raising funds and, 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 and helping to support it financially. The same is true for the civil rights um, movement, same is true whether you believe it or not, for the black power movement. Uh, many people don't understand that the black Panthers were heavily supported by um, white people who were um, putting their money behind people like Jane Fonda, <clears throat> uh, who were raising money out of Hollywood to, to support this movement. And so I think those of us who, who, who are centered in a race and class analysis, which I think is essential, um, have an understanding that uh, organizing across uh, race and class um, is, is absolutely uh, essential to, to success uh, in, in order for us to be successful. And so my father, as you had mentioned, was the head of the Black Panther Party. The Black Panther Party was aligned with um, with the Asian movement, it was aligned with the the the, the white movement. It was aligned with the uh, indigenous movement. My father worked very close with Corky Gonzalez um, here in in this city. So this is not a new concept, but it's not a concept that's really talked about either. It's not a concept that's highlighted in the whole colorful Colorado theme, right? Which is how have 
people of color in the rainbow organize themselves uh, to 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 uh, to fight against you know white hegemony and, and white supremacy inside of the state. And so, um, I would encourage people just to look back on that history and to delve deeper into that history in order to have an understanding that although you know the, the new movement is here and 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 it's important you know Black Lives Matter and and and, and what came with George Floyd, you see that's a much more, di it's, it's a very diverse movement, but that's not new, right? That, that, that's nothing new when, when you're 12% of the population, uh, like black people are in the United States, which is almost mirrored in Colorado, then uh, in, in Denver, or it used to be, uh, and you understand that if we want to, to fight against oppression, um, that it has to be a multiracial, multi-generational, multi-gendered, um, movement. It can't be just, you know, one group. Thanks, so Lisa or Joy? Yeah, I want to <clears throat> thank Joy for acknowledging the anti-Blackness and the Asian community um, and being Afro-Latina um, it's also in the Latinx community and it's in the black community that this is how we are socialized to um, think in terms of black folks that we have to, you know, as, as Angela Davis talk, talked about when in pushing back against mass incarceration, that the only way that black folks can be productive is under, you know, threat of violence or a lash. Um, of being dealt with much more harshly of, you know, Dr. Philip Goff um, with the Center for Policing Equity did a, a phenomenal study when after Tamir Rice, the 11 year old black child who was shot dead within seconds of a white police officer rolling up on him, um, that black uh, white officers tend to see black children as much older and bigger than they are. Um, and so this feeds into the school to prison pipeline, this anti-blackness. And so, we, so part of it um, is rooted in, in well, uh, it, it's rooted in white supremacy, all of it, but how it's manifested through our various cultures is that we're also not immune from um, internalizing those messages and using them against each other. And so when we feel like there's just a limited amount of freedom, then we tend to all fight for the crumbs as opposed to um, coalition building which is, you know, one of the things, again, from one of the questions in the chat about, you know, references to Stapleton at DU and being a DU uh, alum myself, you know, absolutely, I wouldn't want to see that. I mean, the fact that it would still be a question um, that we still have these names um, that are honoring, uh, you know, a, a Klansman, it's just, you know, our, our history, our culture also needs to be fluid. It's living. If it wasn't living, we wouldn't be here in a, um, uh, you know, we would be in a segregated place where we could only speak to our group of people. So we are um, history in the making. And so how we do that across cultures is through that coalition building. You know, I would not have come in third in a mayoral race, never running a political race in my life with virtually no money if it wasn't for white folks voting for me. So a whole lot of white people voted for me that I never knew because of the things that I espoused around issues of social justice um, and equity and women's equality. And so I think those are, you know, even though we have um, some white folks who feel guilty about gentrification, um, you know, guilt is a useless emotion. What we need to do is move to action. And how can that privilege be used to be a voice for supporting um, changes, for example, to our group living amendment where you have you know, South Park Hill people who, who some of them just want to keep it as single resident zoning and never mind the rest of us who are packed and concentrated into places because again, this is a legacy of redlining where we don't have housing options. So we all need to use our voices together to say, we want expanded opportunities that includes housing opportunities that includes employment and education opportunities as well. And we have to do it through a coalition. That's how we, we were able to get abolition and the women's right to vote and all of those things is working across um, our, our cultural and ethnic groups. Thank you, Thank you Lisa. Joey, you have any, anything to add? Um, I just wanted to say thank you to Lisa and Saul and really um, 
talking about how strong we are when we are building coalitions, how much more we can accomplish when we're working together. I do want to know also that um, one of the first uh, large, I believe is the longest student strike in history was by the Third World Liberation Front. And this was a coalition of um, students from all different backgrounds, from Asian American backgrounds, from um, Latinx backgrounds, from um, African American Black backgrounds. And they were able to push for Black studies, ethnic studies, and a lot more, um, a lot more uh, equal, like equal treatment from the administration. And they were really truly able to do this because they banded together and they were able to push for um, something that they understood um, would benefit them all. Thank you. Um, I wanted, um, before you hop into your next question, I don't want to, uh, I'm just learning how cool this feature is and, and that you have this question feature. And it's good to see Sochi uh, on the line here. But Richard asked this question, and, and I never really uh, um, had the opportunity to talk about the violence piece that you that you had mentioned, right? Um, but I, I wanted to circle back back to that because the reason why I got into education justice was because of the pre preschool to prison pipeline, right? And people don't quite if if you're white or if you're affluent, you may not understand that the first time that black people see police officers is in their homes necessarily it's in their schools right and so our first introduction to who police is police are and our black bodies being policed generally happens on a school campus and so um it, it, it's important to understand and again this is where denver is so dangerous right because you, you get this whole uh, not in the way that you mean it but in the way that it was sold this whole colorful colorado and it's a very progressive place but when you look inside of the school systems it's absolutely brutal to black and brown indigenous people and when i say brutal i mean leading the nation uh, uh in disparities uh, specifically black children uh, leading the nation, third in the nation, as far as disparities are concerned. Uh, and this is happening, uh, and I, I, I don't want to fail to mention this, this is happening in a, in a city that has a Black mayor, and speaking of violence, right, oftentimes when Black people even raise their voice to, 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 to articulate a pushback against this whole notion that Black people are doing great in Denver, and then they point to people like Albus Brooks or they point to people like the mayor or point to the people like Chris Herndon and say, look, at, you know, there's representation there. Those people are all oftentimes the very people that are pushing the policies that work directly against black and brown people, specifically Albus Brooks, um, when he was in office, oversaw a, a, a huge um, gentrification process that took place inside of the nation, I mean, inside of Denver, which was one of the largest in the nation, including Michael Hancock and Albus Brooks, who called in uh, for federal funding to put shot spotters on the east side to make sure that black and brown people were being policed at a higher rate inside of the city more than any other groups of people. And so all of those things are specifically sorted around violence when you understand that when child, black and brown children start to fail out of high school or middle school or now elementary school, there's a pathway to the prison. And, and, and when you start to understand that prison industrial companies on Wall Street are, are, are using tests from the, to determine what kind of, how many prison cells that they're going to build, then you can begin to understand the, the, the connection of violence between schooling and, 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 and the prison uh, system. And so I would again ask people just to take a deep dive when it comes to these type of things, because it's really on the surface and which is also, also why living in Denver can be so, so traumatizing for black and brown people, because if this is considered progressive, Right, and no, we don't have a statue of uh, uh, of of any of the southern uh, generals. But right outside Capitol, there's a, there's some very interesting statues that still lay around Denver. We just got rid of Stapleton, and I would like to push back on on, on a panelist that earlier said that the reason why they got rid of the name Stapleton was because of George Floyd. No, the reason why they got rid of the name Stapleton is because Tay Anderson, along with his co colleagues, said they was about to bring about 400, 500 people up inside of Stapleton to protest. Then they decided to change the name. That's what happened because Black people have been dying all this time. So oftentimes, I, I will put a pin in it there. I just want to make note 
uh, of that fact that oftentimes um, our violence is silenced through this idea of progressive, uh, them being a progressive place or Colorado being a progressive place when the people uh, on the grassroots and the grass tops would beg to differ. And, and so I don't think we're in disagreement about that. I think the point is, is that Tay Anderson also didn't do it alone. Uh, and in galvanizing that, that that was built on years of people <clears throat> demanding, you know, myself and yourself and others, that that name be changed. And so I think that's part of the, the social justice, civil rights um, continuum is that everything builds on something else. And so, you know, it's really important that you, when we do get tired and we, the barriers are there to know that, um, you know, we have, it's like, you know, it's that marathon where we're not, we're not running it alone. Um, it, it takes a lot. Um, and I want people also to not get discouraged because we hear that a lot too. Like we didn't see any, any changes post George Floyd in terms of, you know, city council did not um, do anything differently with funding. They didn't change policies of policing. Um, and so, but, but, you know, people need to continue uh, because this is a long, a long game. And yeah, it's a marathon. And I'm sorry, I didn't mean to say that, that we were in disagreement. I, I was, adding some context or the wrinkle to white folks in Stapleton didn't all of a sudden grow a conscious once George Floyd was killed. It was through the threat of having 400 black, brown and white people united marching inside of Stapleton uninvited for a festival of lights or anything that made them all of a sudden be like, okay, we might, it might now it might be time. But no, you're absolutely right. You're absolutely right with that. <clears throat> I say this, uh... Sort of, sort of the idea of naming, I think, so what you talked about, sort of the, everybody's talked about the, the importance of institutions and systems, right? And I, I think one of the questions is sort of talked about, you know, the, the number of people of color in the, in the military and the National Guard, right? And the incongruence between National Guard members, you know, being deployed to protect um, U.S. capitals, right, um, against Black Lives Matter pr protesters, right? And um, and then, of course, what we saw in Washington D.C. in in uh, the, the last couple of weeks. But these are these are institutions and sy systems, right, that reinforce uh, through the use of violence, right, reinforce our color line, right. Uh, I think in a variety of ways, both subtle and certainly much more um, explicit, right, uh, literally with guns. Um, so I. I know that as people are, are starting to, to fall off of this panel, we're scheduled till, till 1.30, but I'll, I'll, I'll wrap us up here by 1, 1.15, 1.20 at the latest. But what I wanted to do is just give you all a chance to talk a little bit about the work that you're doing um, in, in each of the spaces you are. Um, I know all of you have talked a little bit about, about that, but I'm, I'm curious how, you know, sp specifically what, what what do we need to know, um, you know, particularly to make the, the type of colorful Colorado that I've certainly suggested, right? But certainly to, to reimagine, you know, certainly, uh, you know, the history, I think the long struggle of, of, um, of racial justice, um, and, you know, that's tied to what we call our mountain peaks, what we call our schools, what we call our buildings, right? Um, now, this is all part of a large continuum, and all of you are, are playing a real big part in that. So, um, Joey, I'll, I'll start with you. What, 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 are, what are you working on that we should know about? Uh, I mentioned this earlier, but the um, Denver Asian American Pacific Islander Commission, we are working on sort of revitalizing the historic Chinatown that existed in downtown Denver. Um, it's been a process thus far, to say the least, but we're getting some traction. The first thing that we're able to do is we had the mayor declare um, October 31st as a Chinatown Memorial Day. Um, and then now we are working on um, rewriting and remaking some of the plaques that are around um, downtown Denver. There is only one plaque that speaks briefly about the um, riot, but it is um, it uses some derogatory terms and it also focuses more on the white saviors that had stepped in um, during the actual riot. So we're looking to redo that. Um, if you'd like to keep up with what we're doing, um, I highly recommend um, folks to like us on Facebook. It's just the Denver Asian American Pacific Islander Commission. Um, I'm also um, working to start a diversity, equity, and inclusion firm. We're just launching um, this week, actually. 
Um, we started by doing um, some anti-Blackness training within our communities, addressing anti-Blackness um, within the Asian Pacific Islander communities, why that exists and why it is, um, um, why, it is why it shouldn't exist. Um, and then um, those are the main things I'm working on, I guess. Um, I'm excited to also um, work in conjunction with um, any of the folks here today on any other projects that um, might need some support. Thank you, Joey. So I'll turn, turn it to you. Um, thank you. So first and foremost, thank you for inviting me to speak on this panel. I'm a, um, it's great to, have, to, to meet Joey and, and the work that she's doing um, is, is very exciting. I'm a huge fan of Lisa Calderon and have been for quite some time. Um, just a real, real badass in, in all the best ways that, that that could even be talked about. And, and so if, if for people who are not familiar with her work, uh, I would really encourage you to, to get in contact and, and, and follow up with who and the work is that, that she does. It's just really amazing, amazing work. Um, as, far, as far as the Righteous Rage Institute and, and, and what we're involved in, currently we are running a Black People Breathe campaign. <clears throat> And the Black People Breathe campaign is really uh, situated and, and a pushback against this notion that uh, we're not in control of, of, of our destinies and we're not in control of our our energies and, and, and how we are able to move um, and to uh, really begin to teach people that um, liberation is an inside out um, process. It's not something just to be done externally. Um, during uh, Lisa's run and, and during my times as activism, and this is what really spurned this on, one of the things, uh, one of the concepts that Lisa uh, um, introduced to me that I just thought was was brilliant was this, this idea of lateral violence, right? Like the violence that, that we do to each other, right? In the process of seeking our own liberation. Yes, we, have, we know historically that the FBI, CIA has engaged in ways and means to undermine our movements. And a lot of those gaps are left open because we have this undealt with trauma inside of our communities uh, emotional mental health issues that don't get dealt with that leave us uh, open and susceptible to those manipulations and allows us then to strike out at each other. And we, we call this crabs in a barrel, we call this all kind of colloquialisms, but needless to say, it breaks up the uni unity that is necessary um, in order for us to achieve a, a collective liberation. And so we're doing a Black People Breathe campaign for 20 days where Black people are being encouraged every morning to take eight minutes and 46 seconds in honor of George Floyd and all Black, Brown, Indigenous, working class, poor white people that have been killed uh, at the hands of police violence uh, and state sanctioned violence inside of our communities. So that is one piece that we're doing. Of course, for the last six months in conjunction with DU and Dr. Maria Salazar, we have been running our Freedom School where we deal with over 150 parents, black, brown, indigenous, working class, white parents uh, in freedom schools uh, where we, we educate both the students and the parents around uh, uh, in, in the spirit of freedom school, a liberatory um, African uh, indigenous centered education. And so those are two of the main uh, pieces that, that we do as long as you, as you well know, Tom, that we're doing equity work inside of SME, small, medium, medium scale enterprises uh, in order to, who are looking to uh, decolonize and to um, do anti-racist training on an institutional level. So those are really the things, the three pieces of work that we're really engaged in right now have been very busy, unfortunately, um, with the decolonization, the, the, the anti-racism, but also fortunately, because it, 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 there is a, we, I think we have a window here where people are paying attention. So uh, um, people can find us. I'll make sure I, I drop our website inside of the, uh, the chat. Thank you, so mm -hmm. Lisa. Yeah, again, just such a pleasure being on with you, Tom and Sol. You've been doing work and knowing each other for years. I feel like it's a continuum. And Joey, what, a, what an honor and privilege. You're a badass yourself um, to, to meet you. So I'm, I'm so glad to be on this panel with you as well. Um, so what I'm working on, so obviously the group living and the reason I bring it up is because we have our hearing on it in city council coming up on Monday night. Um, and uh, basically it's, it's revising 
the a text amendment to the zoning code that's saying, you know, right now it's illegal for two unrelated people or a, a more than two unrelated people to live together, which is ridiculous. And we know that other places across many other places that are progressive cities um, have much more latitude um, to allow people five, 10 or no limit at all. So how we define being able to live together in our homes is really what we are challenging. And especially um, considering that we are the second most gentrifying city in the nation for Latinx people, we're the number one gentrifying city in the nation. And we know that a lot of the language about keep them out, keep their trucks out, they have too many cars, really is, is gearing toward um, Latinx folks. So, um, so, you know, pay attention to that, add your voices, contact your city council member uh, about supporting, expanding the, the, the changes to, to group living. And this includes places where to be able to have um, smaller halfway houses because, you know, 98% of people are coming out of incarceration. They do better when they have stable places to live. And we need to be able, that's part of justice reform. That's part of reducing mass incarceration. Um, so keep your eyes on that and um, support it if you are so inclined. Um, we're also working on justice reform issues. Um, it's a big blow that our independent monitor, Nick Mitchell, has resigned to do some um, federal justice work in, for LA's jails, but it's a big loss for Denver. And so we are pushing for a community input process, just like we had with, when Nick was here, um, for, for the community to be able to have a say. So when those announcements are made, please, you know, sign up, be part, you know, one, we have to be able to get community uh, input sessions. So that's, that's a, an ask for people to contact, um, Kristen Bronson, who is our city attorney, who is actually running uh, that process um, from the city's end and is also in competition for the Attorney General of Colorado, which would be a big travesty. No one who pushes through a policy for the sweeps in Denver, um, for punishing and doing violence to unhoused people through the homeless sweeps should be our next Attorney General. So that's another thing I'm working on. And then just finally, um, continuing to uh, encourage women of color running for office. Um, we ran as a cohort and brilliant women of color filmmaker, Rebecca uh, uh, Henderson did a uh, documentary called Running With My Girls um, to follow me and Candy Sidabaka and others of us running together. Um, but it basically shows the power structure in Denver and how hard it is to cross that barrier. And we knew that if we could just get one across um, that that would be worth it. And we did, we got candy across, but that doesn't mean our job is done. Elections are in about two years. And so women of color interested in running for office, contact me. Well, I just want to thank you all again. You all are, you all are badass to, to the bone and uh, just, just really appreciate your, your wisdom, uh, your passion. We, we tout ourselves as a private university committed to the public good. And, and we will, we will put, um, within for our DU community resources connected to your work um, and some of the larger resources related to the history of, of, of race in Colorado uh, for people to have. I, I hope that our, our community can, can engage with, with all of you and, and really kind of lift, continue to lift the work that you all have been lifting for so long. Uh, so thank you all. Um, thank everybody. A big thank you to everybody that, that has stayed with us through, through the entire panel. And um, we continue tomorrow with uh, uh, another Diversity Summit panel to, to begin in, in the afternoon. Thank you, everybody. <laughs>